Professor Dr. Wolfgang Alt, Practical Tips on Attracting Chinese Visitors. This is Wolfgang's second event on this expo. We had very positive uh, remarks, comments to his first event, so we are excited to see what he has to sell us today. Wolfgang Alt is a leading expert on China tourism, on China outbound tourism. He studied and worked in China. He tells me he still knows so much Mandarin that he can order a beer, but that's also about that, I guess. Um, Wolfgang is both a hands-on guy and an academic. He was a full-time professor in Germany on tourism management for many years, and he's still a visiting professor on a number of, um, number of uh, universities all over the world. Besides that, or mainly he runs Kotri. Kotri is focusing on China, China outbound. It's a research institute, it's a consulting company, and I am pretty sure his services will be very much needed in the next couple of months when China will hopefully be sending visitors to the world again. Wolfgang, the floor, the dance floor is yours, please. Okay. Um, hello, everybody, and uh, thank you, Jan, for the kind introduction. And so uh, on Monday, we have been talking about uh, the general uh, development of Chinese outbound tourism. And uh, today, I want to look a bit more into the future uh, and, and see uh, what, where are we now and where can we go from here and what can you do as a company, as a destination uh, to prepare for the market and uh, how maybe to attract uh, more or maybe better uh, Chinese uh, visitors to your place again, or maybe even for, for the first time. So uh, I have prepared a little presentation, uh, but I hope also that uh, there will be some Q&A uh, afterwards. So, that, so if you have any questions, uh, I think you can use the, the chat uh, function uh, to type them uh, while you're listening or afterwards if you like. I hope you can see the, the slides now. Is that okay? Okay, very good. So, uh, attracting Chinese visitors for destinations on and off the, the beaten track. So, uh, as Jan already mentioned, so uh, this is based on the work of the China Outbound Tourism Research Institute. Uh, we are a member of a couple of organizations, uh, most importantly, uh, the UNWTO. So we are affiliate member and, and some others. And what is Kotli doing? Uh, briefly saying, we help companies all over the world to understand the Chinese outbound market better, to give good services to Chinese and earn money while you're doing that. One of the uh, main instruments for doing this, uh, especially in the last uh, couple of months and probably also the coming months is uh, a online training, uh, which we developed with the Hong Kong uh, Polytechnic University School of Hotel Tourism Management, uh, and this is for five verticals or five um, branches of the industry, and it's a rather extensive uh, program ending with a university certificate. So that is probably for those of you who are want to want to go deeper into the market, but highly truly recommend it. Every month there's an update on the uh, COVID nineteen situation, so. Uh, provide as, as well. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. So if, if you hear sound, don't worry. This is outside. We just have a thunderstorm here in Hamburg, northern Germany. We'll be over in a few minutes. I hope you can still hear me. So uh, already uh, about me, uh, not much to say other than I've been working with China for quite some time. First time I went there is 1978. And ever since I've been connected to tourism and uh, to China, of course, uh, nobody could have known that uh, China would become such a big and strong country and that tourism would be such an important uh, part uh, in it and that the Chinese are, as if you listened on Monday, you know that Chinese are the by far biggest uh, tourism source market in the world. So what's the current situation uh, with our Dear uh, visitor, the COVID-19. So uh, 
basically saying, well, the reasons why the Chinese are traveling out front has not changed. The Chinese are still eager to come back onto the international market. All surveys show that given the uh, availability of, of visa and air connections and that they are trusting it is safe to travel. So domestic tourism has already started again and we will talk about this a bit more later. And you can see uh, if you go on Skyscanner or something, uh, the sky is rather empty of aircraft, much emptier than it used to be, but over China it's back to uh, previous levels. So domestically, uh, the, almost all the aircraft are flying again. So we can see that at the moment, China is actually the only country in the world where you have a substantial tourism business activities. Uh, of course, here in Europe, uh, we are just starting uh, to have some summer holiday trips, but all this is still uh, just the beginning and reduced numbers and uh, keeping distance and so on. So it's nothing compared to the numbers we see in China. So uh, unfortunately, as you are all aware of, the uh, COVID-19 situation is, is very bad. So these are the numbers from uh, noontime uh, yesterday. So that uh, we had more than 10 million cases and we had more than half a million dead people. And we have more than uh, 50,000 people in critical uh, conditions. So by now, uh, out of 1 million human beings, uh, 1,300 had an infection and 66 out of million have actually died. And uh, we had uh, 174,000 uh, cases uh, on July 1st. And actually, I saw that uh, the latest number was for yesterday, actually 195,000 that's still going on. And it's, I'm sorry, that's a type with 5,072 uh, deaths on, on, the, on that day. So we have, uh, uh, United States yesterday had for the first time more than 50,000 new cases, which of course is uh, very unfortunate. And if you compare this with China, so China uh, on the 1st of July stood on this on position 22 with 83,000 cases and on position 19 with 4,600 uh, deaths from uh, COVID-19. So that's it used to be number one in January and February, and it has been moving down uh, and has been overtaken by countries like uh, Saudi Arabia and, and Chile uh, with much, much smaller populations. So it seemed to be in the beginning to be a Chinese problem, but of course, since March, it has become uh, a, a global problem. Uh, and uh, well, we, we can we can share the belief that it will somehow go away as some people in some uh, capitals of the free world are saying, but well, we, we will see. So where, where is this happening? Uh, and you can see, uh, so this is June 30 confirmed cases. And you can see that the uh, United States is about a quarter. Brazil is almost a quarter. Uh, so they together are already responsible for half the cases. And so the, uh, the top uh, 14 countries with more than 2,000 cases already are making up like 85% or so of the total. So which means that for all other countries, we, we still have the virus active, but there are many countries where uh, it has been going down to a, a, a few or a, 10 or 20 or 50 or 100. So, uh, but of course, it's still in, in some countries still very, very active. For the Chinese, so uh, they already started on April to have the first time uh, being allowed out again from their lockdown, and they have been traveling a lot uh, since then. And uh, in May, there was a May holiday, they had a, officially 150 million. Chinese people traveling domestically. Uh, of course, everybody's wearing a mask. And of course, there's hygiene all over the place and the attractions are only open 30%. And just uh, last week, we had the uh, Dragon Boat Festival, which is a uh, three days holiday in, in China. And uh, so we could see also that this was altogether 
uh, 80 million people traveling. So 50 million people have visited one of the 10,000 attractions uh, which are open again, which can be uh, the Imperial Palace, but also some uh, national parks and so on. So which is about half of the number of uh, last year, but it's only 31% of the revenue. So we can see that on average, uh, the trips were shorter and there was more self-drive tours. So a lot of people using their car uh, because probably the, they feel safer in it. So you don't have to trust anybody else with uh, hygiene. So you can, uh, in your own car, you know who's with you and uh, you can uh, spray it down as often as, as you want. Uh, and also that people are a little bit more careful in, in their spending. So Beijing was not very active in tourism because there's still a lockdown of some uh, parts of Beijing, uh, surrounding, of, surrounding of Beijing, because they had some uh, outbreaks there. So altogether we see we had uh, 20 million people using trains. Like on the photo, you can see this is Shanghai Hongqiao railway station. Uh, and you had more than two and a half million people using an airplane and more than 50 million people going on a road trip. So as we said before, if you look for active tourists, well, you have to look to China. So the, uh, I think we skipped this one. So in, in the last months and in this month now in July, as you know, there is a process that many uh, borders are reopened. So within the European Union, uh, the in, inter, internal borders were opened. And uh, since uh, yesterday uh, in Europe, also some uh, people from outside of Europe are allowed to come uh, into Europe again uh, from, for instance, Australia and from South Korea and Japan. For China, the situation is that uh, the European Union has said if the Chinese allow Europeans back into China, then we will allow the Chinese back into Europe. So as we are speaking, uh, it is not as was expected that from July 1st, Chinese can come back to Europe, but it will take another two weeks or four weeks before uh, this is happening. Uh, there are some countries outside European Union, like Serbia, for instance, uh, and Turkey, where this is already uh, different. So as a Chinese since you can visit Serbia and you can visit Albania, Greece, and uh, also Turkey. And behind the scenes, I've been told that there are also discussions to have some special funnels and tunnels and green lanes and golden lanes or what have you uh, to bring especially business people uh, and engineers and so on traveling uh, back and forth. And also we can see that uh, many airlines have already started to have an increase in the number of flights to China or are doing so this week uh, or, or next week. So we can see <coughs> there is an increase uh, and, and tourism is uh, starting. But what do we need to restart it uh, fully? Three things. One is uh, <coughs> for the Chinese travelers, the permission to leave China and to enter the host destination. So this is from our side. As we just said, the European Union and of course other countries have to let the Chinese in. Some countries like Australia already said before the end of the year, nothing happens. Uh, but uh, in most other places uh, like the Maldives, just an example, uh, are opening on the 15th of July and then Chinese people can start to fly to the Maldives anymore uh, again. And maybe they, there are some ideas to do this with private jets where they can fly directly uh, from a safe environment to a safe environment. Sorry for that. Uh, <clears throat> the second point is, is there connectivity? So are there affordable air tickets? And the third point, of course, is there trust uh, of the Chinese uh, <coughs> outbound tra tra travelers? So. <coughs> Sorry, in the safety of the destination. So China, and I talked about this on Monday, uh, has been using tourism always as a soft power tool 
And so there will be the question, what will be the balance between uh, making sure there's no new outbreaks of COVID-19 on the one hand, and uh, allowing the Chinese uh, to travel again and to show their friendly relation to those countries uh, they want to uh, give preference to. So because freedom of travel has been a cornerstone of the Chinese government's policies in granting levels of freedom, so you can have shopping, you can have your private car, you can play with the stock market, uh, you can choose which universities to study, and of course also where to travel, all this have been uh, part of the contrast social between the people and the party so that uh, the people can have uh, their private uh, happiness and the party can stay in power. So uh, what is the new situation in hopefully soon post COVID-19 times? So that we need a new paradigm for international tourism has been seen long before COVID-19 crippled the tourism industry in the last month. So we have seen, uh, we have been the, the victims of our own success. So we can see from the year 2080 to 2019, the number of international tourists uh, developed five times. So, and uh, if you look just on, on, on the graph, so this is only from uh, 1995, uh, you can see we, we were at something like uh, 500 million and uh, 2019, we reached 1.46, almost 1.5 billion arrivals last year. Uh, so, and also the, as is on the graph, you can see there have been some slowdowns, uh, September 11, the SARS crisis of 2009, the global economic crisis of two, uh, uh, 2003, global economic crisis of 2009, but all this just have been dense in the general upward development. So, which is very nice. We can be all very happy and I think a lot of people uh, earn good money in, in tourism and, and hospitality and aviation in the last decade. We created a lot of jobs, but this very success has made a, a mockery of the idea of uh, hospitality, uh, what in German is called Gastfreundschaft, being a friend with, uh, the, uh, with the visitors. Uh, and we see that this is a juggernaut running over local culture, local nature, right over diversity. There's no room anymore for serendipity. Everything is planned and, and put into square boxes. And as a result, we saw that all stakeholders had a decreasing level of satisfaction. The people at the overcrowded beaches or at the uh, museums full of people, as well as the locals uh, being more and more annoyed by uh, travelers and Chinese travelers always being the culprit uh, for that. Also what we have seen, and this is something which really now in the last half year we saw is uh, damaging uh, our ability to, to react is that uh, tourism and hospitality has, have become very lazy. So there is a clear lack of innovation in many uh, fields. So uh, in many hotels, you still have to fill out a paper form by hand, uh, standing in front of a counter. So you feel like you're, you're applying for and have to ask, please, please, may I stay in your hotel when actually you're the customer and you're paying the money. So and there's, the technology has been there for, for years and years. Uh, and they have your data anyway. Uh, most people do on, online booking. So what's the point in having to fill out the form uh, again? And now what is the result? We find that some hotel groups say, don't worry, uh, the pen to fill out the paper form, form has been sterilized. So you can't catch the virus from that. Yeah, but you still, you still have to use. So they're not changing, they're still using the pens. And, uh, or there's a lot of uh, uh, hotel groups saying, uh, the remote control for the television 
uh, is disinfected, I don't know, every, every two hours or whatever. There is this uh, BYOD, uh, bring your own device technology, has been around for a long time. And some <coughs> uh, airlines have already, for instance, started this that you, you don't have a uh, screen anymore in, in, in the uh, aircraft, but you, uh, they, they beam some uh, entertainment programs, some, some movies, some, some, some uh, uh, music, and you can look at your own smartphone or your own uh, tablet, uh, you, 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 you can watch that. So uh, there are some hotels where you have uh, BYOD technology, there are some hotels where they have something like Alexa, so where you can tell Alexa, please turn on the television. Uh, but still, Alexa doesn't help allow you to screen uh, with a smart TV your own uh, Netflix stuff on, on to, onto the big screen or something like that. So all this we can see there has been uh, not much done and, and uh, tourism industry has been falling behind in many ways. So <clears throat> the Chinese outbound tourists have often been named as the culprits for over-tourism uh, and uh, have been seen as walking wallets, providing uh, new arrival, increased arrival numbers and spending, but not being really uh, taken uh, serious. And uh, so Chinese travelers, therefore, are very anxious that and, and have also the experience and certainly the feeling that their, their needs and their demands are not suffi sufficiently taken care of. So. Uh, and also, of course, if you talk to uh, people working in hotels or other tourist service providers, many will say, oh, we don't like actually the Chinese customers are too, uh, too rude and too uh, demanding and, and so on. And uh, on, the, on the slide, you can see, so this is actually a, from a satirical uh, magazine from Swedish television, uh, where they were, they were making jokes about this anti-Chinese tourist uh, attitude, but this as uh, uh, satire uh, uh, is not very well understood in China. So there was a big uproar how to, uh, you can show uh, Chinese visitors in this uh, not very nice uh, uh, situation like on here, which in Chinese said, so don't, don't shit here. Sorry for that. Uh, so, and, and the, the Swedish ambassador had to come the foreign office and to apologize and, and so on and so on. Uh, so, but this is also something, uh, never mind the virus, this was a problem which has been uh, there before. But actually, if we look at the real situation, we can find that already before the virus, about two thirds of Chinese travelers did not fit anymore into this idea that they are just coming in big groups, uh, uh, jumping out of the bus, taking a photo, uh, Traveling down the lawn and not really interested where they are and only eating Chinese food. So actually, the majority of Chinese travelers are already traveling individually or in, in small groups. And we see that there has been a demand, and this demand has been even increasing, that they want to live like locals and uh, learn something about the local uh, culture. And uh, as we already discussed on Monday, the language barrier has become less important because, on the one hand, Year by year, more people join the travelers' uh, groups which learn English in school. Uh, and also, uh, we have lots of gadgets now, technology, which can help automatic uh, translation. So, of course, until the cure and the vaccination for COVID 19 is found, this topic of sanitation and hygiene and wearing masks and so on uh, will require more attention and transparent communication to regain the trust of the Chinese guests. And it's, it's not only that you have to do things, you have to talk about them, you have to show them, you have to prove them. So uh, I saw some examples of a hotel lobby with a huge LED screen, which I think normally is used to uh, give information about uh, what's happening in the conference uh, center of the hotel, where now you could see for every single employee, with a, with a photo, uh, and uh, when was the last time that this guy disinfected his clothes and his hands and so on? And you could see that all this was uh, 50 minutes ago, 
65 minutes ago. Uh, so with so all uh, you could see that all the people do this very very frequently, and that so I thought that's a good example to not only say don't worry, but actually prove that there is a lot of uh, things going on. But uh, but hoping that in a year from now we have this behind us and uh, hoping that the new G4 swine flu virus is not as bad as uh, uh, some people are now uh, fearing it is. So uh, we have an opportunity to change the way how we how we think Chinese outbound tourism and how we react to Chinese outbound tourism and maybe that will spill over into other tourism as well to have a quadruple win a win 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 situation for the guests for the hosts for the tourism companies and uh, of course for our dear little planet so what is the most practical tip for china up on tourism in the 2020s it is welcoming chinese tourists by trying harder than before to understand them and to accept them in their diversity and by providing different levels of immersion into the destination with adequately adapted products. So maybe you say, oh, this doesn't sound so practical, but this is exactly what you can, what you can see, what has been lacking. So that uh, I've been doing a lot of uh, trainings or consulting where I start by asking people, okay, you have Chinese customers? Yes. Where do they come from? Oh, China. Uh, yeah, where in China? I mean, there's a big, the big difference between somebody from Beijing and somebody from Guangzhou is the same as between somebody from Norway and somebody from Portugal. Yes, they're Europeans, but everybody will understand that Norwegians are different from Portuguese. Uh, and it turns out that many people not even know from which part of China, which is as big as Europe, uh, they're coming. So I think in the United States, you will have some idea somebody is coming uh, from, from Ohio or from California, uh, from Maine or from uh, Massachusetts, that there will be a bit different people. Uh, so uh, to understand uh, what, uh, what, who are these people and also understand that these people are different people. It's not a Chinese person it is, uh, and that they have different, uh, interests and different needs and that there's some that you have uh, you don't have to you don't have to follow them it's it's not that you have to like them i hate karaoke uh <laughs> i don't like it at all but if my chinese customers want karaoke then okay why not provide this hotel uh, a room where they can have karaoke and you can even charge them for that if you earn some money so this is a very simple understanding that chinese want to be recognized as persons and that they have the feeling that this is very often not the case. So as I very often have the feeling like in a hotel that I'm room number 750, I'm not, not even the guy in room 750, I am room number 750 and that's how I'm treated and I don't like it. And the Chinese are even more anxious that this is done to them uh, and that people laugh behind their back about them because maybe their English is not so good or uh, they, they, they have not yet learned how to behave in, in certain surroundings. So that uh, for that, of course, you need uh, a deeper understanding and uh, allow me to say that we try with our online training and with other tools to help uh, organizations with that. But this is simply uh, what everybody will, will accept automatically if you have a different markets that you need to know uh, uh, something about the different customers that for China, this has still been the case until now that people think, oh, uh, I know the Chinese or even worse people talking about the Asians uh, as if Indians, uh, Singaporeans, Chinese and Japanese would be the same kind of people when they are actually not at all. So practical things to do, you will have to change your KPIs. So what is your uh, measurement of, of success? So, uh, and that, uh, that there has to be 
the satisfaction included. This is uh, uh, from from all our research, from all the discussions in the last months. We have a lack in the level of satisfaction. So satisfaction of the customers, of the staff, of the locals, and indirectly also uh, preserving the nature, uh, so the satisfaction of the planet of Gaia. So fortunately, uh, if you if you invest in the uh, satisfaction, you will still have money left because uh, what is driving Chinese uh, uh, travelers is first of all what we call a warm square. So the word of mouse and the word of mouse, the computer mouse. So that uh, if you have stable guest host relations, people like uh, to be at your place and, and using your services and recommend you uh, to their friends and to their colleagues. This is much better invested money than spending money on marketing in, in China. And we will talk about this in a minute a bit more. And it will also be increase the productivity of your staff if, if they are happy. And you will also eliminate a source of tension uh, between local population administration. And so uh, this is an, an example. Uh, there's a, a, a company called the Dragon Trail, uh, good friends of us doing very good work. Uh, but if you look if you look at the results, so they make a, a list every every uh, week. What are the uh, activities of NGOs, DMOs, airlines, hotels, and so on in Chinese social media? And so this is a you see a recent uh, week, uh, the ranking for Weibo. And so Weibo is the open platform, which was the big thing until two years, two and a half years ago. Now everything is about WeChat, but still Weibo has a billion users. So it's still in, in, uh, much used. And if, if you see uh, the relationship uh, between the number of, of followers, so we have, uh, Visit Finland has a three quarters of a million followers, but they only have 750 engagements for seven posts. That means on average, 100 persons reading the post. And this is very often something which is made uh, in Chinese and where often the video. So this costs quite a lot of money. But uh, so if you look at the list, no, none of these. Uh, NTOs uh, reach 3,000 engagements and only four reach more than 1,000 en en engagements. And if you, if you look at the DMOs, uh, it's even worse. So if you, if you look, uh, for instance, at, at uh, number 12, uh, Victoria and, and Melbourne, so they have almost a million followers, but uh, the seven posts, they, they reach uh, 251 pairs of eyes. So 0.03% uh, of all the, of all their followers. Uh, so Flanders, if you go to the top of the list, Visit Flanders was successful, 18,000 engagements. Not bad, with just one post. Why is that? Because if you look at the post, it's a lucky draw. You can win uh, either a camera or for the reasons I didn't really understand, some instant coffee uh, cans. So so the lucky draw has been uh, bringing the people to, to the website. If that means you get more tourists to Flanders uh, remains to be seen. And so, yeah, but this is way more maybe WeChat is, is doing better. Uh, so it's uh, unfortunately not much better. So we have, uh, so 84 DMOs, uh, which are surveyed by, by uh, Dragon Trail being active in, in China. And out of these, uh, only the top 10 have got uh, at least 1,100 uh, views per post. And there has been just one post reaching more than 6,000 views. And this is China. So I, I put down there just some numbers just for comparison. So a uh, key opinion leader uh, uh, writing on WeChat and, and Weibo, uh, Laia, and she's not the biggest one has 5 million followers on Weibo. And the number one, uh, uh, Nina, Nana, 
uh, has 117 million followers, which is more than anybody has on Facebook. Uh, so uh, a few weeks ago uh, for the for the NTOs, uh, Monaco was the most successful one because there was uh, a sing another singer uh, giving a concert there and that, that brought them 8,000 views, but these people were not interested in Monaco, they were interested in the singer and 8,000 out of dozens of millions of followers is not even such a big number. So uh, obviously, yes, you have to do some marketing, but I think uh, in, in, uh, in the last years, uh, more and more people have spent more and more money in a louder and louder concert of voices, drowning out individual voices. Uh, and instead, I think what we can see, you have to add KPIs, which are not uh, just based on uh, how much money you spent on marketing. So three levels, red, yellow, green. So it started by, and you still see tourism ministries, for instance, saying, uh, the next year we want to have, we want to reach 2 million arrivals or 10 million arrivals or 500,000 arrivals, whatever. And the, the, the measurement, the KPI is simply arrival numbers. Never mind how much they spent, how long they stay. So the little bit better KPIs are when you add to this, okay, how many nights are they staying? Uh, how much do they spend per visitor per trip? or per visitor per day, whatever. And what's, what's the margin? So how much money is left in my pocket at the end? But for the future to have a stable situation and to attract people to come and recommend you, uh, the green part is what will be the most important one, which means higher level of satisfied visitors because then they will recommend their peers uh, to, to uh, use your services because for most Chinese, they will not come back themselves. Most Chinese still have a, a huge bucket list they have to take off. They only started to travel 10 years ago or many just a few years ago. Uh, they did not travel as a child as most people in Western countries are doing. So they still have to go to this and this and this place. But even they like it at your place or they like your service, they will go somewhere else next year. So it's not to get people coming back again and again. Maybe if you're based in Vietnam or South Korea, the neighboring areas, yes. But if you're based uh, in, in uh, long distance destinations, uh, no way. So, but that they recommend you to their friends, to their family, to their colleagues, that's the key point. And so a higher level of satisfied staff members, as we said, uh, increasing their productivity, their friendliness. So. If they give the Chinese uh, customers a feeling that they're welcome, then that will be also very important for the Chinese that they don't feel that they're just, you just take their money, but you don't really like them. And also this uh, non-alienation of, of locals, avoiding uh, conflicts and thereby in the end, if everybody's more interested in where he or she is, also you will preserve nature and culture in a bigger way. So uh, what do the post-virus Chinese outbound travelers want more than before? So we can see from the service out until now, uh, there's a higher idea or a more positive idea of, of the family. So people have to be uh, living together physically, uh, literally, but also they had to f rely on solidarity within the family. So this is an idea which is more common than before. Uh, nature experience, so very important uh, that uh, it's getting out of the big cities. Uh, generally experiences instead of shopping, traveling to not to overcrowded places. One, of course, also because of hygiene and sanitation, uh, but also uh, to uh, go to new places and uh, to go to places where maybe your neighbor has not been to yet. Uh, and, but also to get in contact, uh, maybe with a mask on, 
to get in contact with locals. So that for many Chinese that they say, okay, we want to learn more about the local culture and, and meet local people and uh, maybe share our common interests and common hobbies and to see what, what is, uh, what they think about the thing, think we are also interested in. And of course, in the short term, everybody is very, very anxious about hygiene and sanitation as in Chinese media. Uh, we outside of China are seen as the guys who are dangerous. So therefore, uh, a key word here is trust. So uh, you will uh, have to be careful that it's possible for uh, the Chinese travelers that they can trust you as their host. So, uh, so you need to show your engagement to the market. Uh, we do this, for instance, just now by uh, watching this, this uh, uh, webinar, uh, uh, visiting this fair. Uh, and we, we had a lot of companies which would uh, provide, uh, send greetings to their Chinese customers and say, well, we are sorry, not here at the moment. Hopefully you can come back soon. And what we said earlier, know your customers. So it, it, I, I talked to many people and they said, well, we can't send an email to our Chinese customers saying, wish you were here, because we don't have their email addresses. They come via a tour operator and the tour operator doesn't give us any data. Yeah, but there are many ways to get the email addresses of your uh, customers. Uh, People just didn't care until now about that. So, so, and so therefore to show your sympathy for the visitors uh, and key point to show your interest in the visitors as both an individual person as well as uh, your interest for the culture they represent. Chinese traveling abroad are still seeing themselves as a member of the Chinese families and what you do to them, they're still thinking you do this because they are Chinese. But on top of that, of course, they also say, well, I'm, I'm a person, I want to be recognized as, as, a, as a person. Uh, and yeah, again, hygiene sanitation is there. So uh, trust is the one word, satisfaction is the other one. So more than ever before, the Chinese will have, and they have learned in the last years, they can compare different levels of, uh, of preparedness for the Chinese market. And uh, so they will, they will more than ever uh, that they are going home and not think it was okay, but that they say, well, it was, gave me exactly what I wanted. And so it's a good time. We all had to learn to think outside of the box, hopefully a bit more in the last few months. And so still, well, for the Chinese market, not much is happening at the moment yet. So we have a bit time also to, to have a step back and, and think about your, your, your product and how it could be changed according what, to the interests of the Chinese businesses. And I put a few examples here. So uh, I remember some years ago, uh, the Spanish position, uh, according to the vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese market, was well. We are a beach destination. They don't like beach, so Chinese market is not for us. But uh, for the Maldives, uh, have been seeing before the virus numbers of Chinese businesses going down because that they 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 said okay, our only product is uh, the beach experience, or the ocean experience. Uh, uh, relaxation and, and some maybe some snorkeling and some uh, fresh fish uh, for dinner. So we don't have any other product product. So people come one time and they don't come back. Uh, so, but the beach is also a place. It's an ecosystem. So, and uh, when I talk to our friends and colleagues in the Maldives, they say, "Yeah, how about you? You you have somebody explaining to the kids uh, traveling." Uh, how all this is uh, relying on each other and, and do this educational thing about using the beach, uh, the coastal area, and, and, and the 
classroom uh, for outdoor classroom for learning about how to ecosystems uh, for me while the parents still can enjoy it. Uh, the snorkeling. So a restaurant is certainly not only about eating. It is also about, you can also say, okay, we are giving you a mini course on how to behave at a formal Western dinner table. So in China, there are schools uh, uh, where you learn etiquettes uh, and the Chinese spend lots of money on being taught uh, which spoon and which glass uh, if you are ever invited uh, by uh, the queen or somebody important here at a formal dinner. So we offer Western food, but we are, we are except, no, expecting, sorry, we are expecting that everybody knows how to eat that stuff. For hotels, of course, this is an old discussion that the hotel is not only a place uh, where you offer a bed and, and, and a shower, uh, and for Chinese, certainly, if you have a hotel, as we discussed before, where you have new technology and you have, which in many cases in China actually is not so new anymore, but where you, they can try out the latest, latest gadgets, uh, that that will be maybe something, or not only maybe, that will be certainly something uh, which will bring you a lot of customers. So at a theme park, uh, Western kids are supposed to play, Chinese kids are supposed to learn. So in the theme park, uh, support the learning aspect. So if you look at, uh, uh, to say something nice about the Danish attraction, uh, uh, Legoland is very successful with Chinese visitors and they go uh, all the way to what's called Billund uh, because uh, Legoland is very much an educational place and uh, uh, Chinese kids learn something there. Uh, of course, by playing, but the, the, the key point is not just having fun, but they, they learn something. And so being friendly to everybody, so saying we treat everybody the same way, the Chinese don't mind if you treat them better than the other people, because they are bringing the most, uh, the biggest amount of money and they are the biggest uh, source market and they are aware of that, they know that. So that you are showing that you're going the extra mile by having, uh, if you excuse my example, having a certificate that you did uh, China tourism training uh, hanging uh, behind your desk or, or in, on your, uh, showing this on your website. So you, you show that to how to treat the Chinese uh, travelers that you did an extra training for that. You didn't do this for the Russians or the Japanese, but for the Chinese, you did that. So giving you go the extra mile for them, that will be uh, very much uh, appreciated. And so, and the last point, so stop thinking of Chinese people as Chinese. Start to think of them as a person, Mr. Wang or Miss, Mrs. Lee. They will still see themselves, of course, as especially outside of China as being Chinese, but they are also individual uh, persons. And once you come to this mindset that this is uh, not all Chinese are the same and you're not thinking because in your local Chinese uh, restaurant, they hang up red lanterns that this is a modern way to uh, decoration. Chinese, modern Chinese people nowadays uh, still uh, like, uh, not at all, uh, and, and, and many other things. So that there is, uh, you have differences between different target groups, but basically it is simply taking your customer serious and, and being curious, trying to learn uh, from the customers, okay, what they like, what they don't like, and they will be more than happy to uh, of life. So if all, if we do a, a questionnaire in China and there's an open question at the end, you have hundreds of people writing, uh, you Western people should understand, or can you please tell the national tourism organizations that they should do this and this for us, Chinese people because of this and this. Uh, and that might be funny things like, why do the Spanish not eat at 6 p.m. like every normal person means every Chinese? Uh, but also 
very often uh, very uh, yeah interesting and, and innovative ideas coming by just asking. And so that's all I wanted to say uh, as a look uh, into the future. And uh, yeah, so uh, just uh, to tell you if you want to move further. Uh, so we have a publication called Country Weekly, which is uh, free of charge, published every week. We have the Turner Tourism Training, uh, which will bring you a big step forward in your ability to uh, give the Chinese what the Chinese want. And also uh, about everything I've been talking about today, there will be a new book coming out uh, probably in more or less exactly a month from now. And I'm very happy uh, that uh, there is uh, a way where we can do this together with uh, uh, our colleagues from, from BATS. So this, this is, uh, I think, just a few thoughts, and I hope that we have some uh, questions. And uh, so over to you, Jan. Yeah, thank you a lot, Wolfgang. A lot of practical details, a lot of information. Um, and I learned one more thing about you today. I said in the introduction, you know enough Mandarin to order a beer, but it turned out when you read the sign, you know a bit more than that. Yes, I do. <laughs> Uh, as Wolfgang said uh, to the audience, um, we have a few minutes for Q&A. So if anybody has uh, questions, please feel free to ask. I think there was a question before, but I don't see it now. Do you see that, Wolfgang? There was a question from Daniela Fundi, I think, but it seemed to be disappearing. I don't see this at the moment. I think it's, uh... No. No, but, uh, but okay. I'm, sure, I'm sure you have some questions. Yeah, then let me start. Um, you mentioned about China coming back pretty pretty fast. You mentioned the Chinese sitting on their suitcases ready to go. Um, but I remember last time we spoke a two week about a two weeks guarantee quarantine when you come back. Is that still in place? Uh, and how long will it probably last? And will it be the same from every destination or the differences there? Yeah, this is, this is uh, you're asking exactly the right question. That's a key question. And I think uh, <clears throat> uh, this week there were three different journalists uh, from three different continents asking me exactly the same question. So this is a key. Until now, until now, the Chinese government uh, has not said anything about if and when they will stop asking everybody coming back from uh, outside of China, anywhere outside of China, to go for two weeks into quarantine. So there is, of course, there have been a lot of uh, rumors. Also, for instance, uh, the biggest number of people who are coming into China, of course, have been coming from Hong Kong. So this is uh, 100 thousands of people every day. And for Hong Kong, it's very important that the border to mainland China is reopened. So never mind uh, leisure tourists to, to Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it's until now, nothing has been said. The European government said three days ago, uh, if you let us in, we let you in. To my knowledge, at least well, until two hours ago, I checked just before we started here, uh, China has given no answer to that yet. So, uh, and therefore, what was told before was that probably by the end of September, so for the Chinese October Golden Week, uh, this will be stopped, but maybe earlier, but, but nobody knows. Of course, it is, it, is, it is something which, this is the, the, the main point, but it is uh, by the stroke of a pen or of a brush, uh, you, can, you can say, okay, from midnight, this is no longer the case, full stop. And what I think what will happen is very likely is that this is not done for the whole world, but that they say, okay, if you have been traveling only to Germany, in Germany there, uh, it, it's safe, okay, then you can come back about the quarantine or to Serbia or uh, to Hong Kong or, or to, to, other, to Vietnam or Cambodia, where there have been officially uh, almost no cases. So okay. that is, that is uh, what I think 
what was going to happen. But of course, the Chinese government is very good at in, in, in keeping the cards close uh, to the bosom, so not showing the poker card to everybody. And so <laughs> it's wait and see. So which destinations do you think will, will be be possible to visit the first? Well, I, I, I'm afraid it's a tough question. The United States and the United Kingdom will be not <laughs> on the top of this list. Uh, with 50,000 new cases in one day. Uh, yeah. That is not very really likely, never mind the politics. Uh, so I think it is, yeah, it will be uh, neighboring, of course, neighboring Asian countries. Sure. So uh, uh, as I just said, so almost all the neighbors like South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, uh, Philippines, uh, Laos, Cambodia, they had not very high numbers of uh, of uh, cases. Uh, some Cambodia even said they had zero until now. You can believe it or not, but uh, but so this will be, of course, it's also the cheapest uh, to go there, the easiest, and you have to don't have to sit a uh, very long time in the aircraft with a mask on. So these, of course, will be uh, the first ones. Hong mm -hmm. Kong, Macau, of course. For, for lower distance, it will be Europe because uh, North and South America are still fully in the control of the virus. And Africa is a place where probably people are afraid to travel to because Africa has the image. And this is, I don't talk about reality. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have very good hospitals in, in Nairobi or in, in the, Dar es Salaam or, or in, in Cape Town. Uh, but the perception is that this is a place with not very good medical services and that there might be some outbreak, uh, which then once it happens cannot be controlled. So therefore, I, I think that leisure tourists, of course, business people will travel to all these places and for leisure tourism, um, from as it looks today, uh, Europe, I think, has the highest uh, probability that, that the Chinese could go there again for okay. leisure. Wolfgang, there's a question from Alexander Gatasevich yeah. whether the Chinese prefer to visit Europe as a package, meaning visiting multiple countries, or if they prefer visiting individual as well. Uh, that yeah. is something you at least touched upon in the last presentation yeah, but but why it, it, it's very easy to answer so it at the beginning it was almost everybody came in a package tour and mm. as time goes by more and more chinese are traveling uh are slowing down and they travel by themselves and they also they travel to to a, a, a smaller number of places and we even now have or we had last year it's, let's say we had package tours even uh, with a tour guide and so the classical thing, uh, 45 people in a bus, which went 10 days to Switzerland, just one country. Uh, so therefore, uh, this frantic rushing around, uh, <laughs> eight countries in seven days, uh, still some people do this, but this is now less and less. So more and more Chinese will say, okay, I go to one or two or three countries. And also more and more people travel according to their interests. So for maybe you say, okay, I do wine tasting and I will go to Portugal, Spain and France or France and Italy for wine tasting. Uh, so, or I will go to, I don't know, Great Britain, Ireland and Iceland for golf uh, because they have nice golf courses. So okay. that is also something where, and of course in Europe, especially within uh, Schengen land and the Eurozone, uh, it doesn't make much difference. I mean, the, the Chinese, if they speak a foreign language, they speak English normally. So therefore, uh, you have Euro currency, uh, you, you need one visa and there's no border, again, hooray, hooray, no border control anymore within uh, at least Schengen land. And uh, so therefore, if uh, Utrecht is a part of Denmark, or Netherlands or Germany doesn't make much difference for, for a Chinese tourist. So mm -hmm. therefore, uh, it is rather 
to say, okay, I go there because my, I can, my hobby is there. So many Chinese people go to Salzburg because of Mozart and they think they're in Germany. <laughs> so wow. far, then Mozart is a German. Uh, so, uh, and it's actually, yeah, it doesn't matter much. But so therefore the, so the, the, the answer is, uh, the more sophisticated travelers, the people with more travel experience, the people with more language ability are more likely to say, let's go to one country and look there, uh, more deeper at this one place. The people who are just starting traveling and are their first time in Europe, they are more likely still to say, okay, I do on a round trip and I do uh, France, Italy, uh, Switzerland, Germany, Austria, uh, all in one in one go. It's basically the same. I mean, the Chinese market is developing now. Um, looking back ten years ago, Americans visiting Europe, they also did all of Europe in in uh, one and a half weeks and couldn't distinguish between Italy and Denmark after. It, it's basically the same picture we're right. seeing. And, and and I would say the other way around as well. I mean, I, I've been working for many uh, uh, many years ago also to bringing. Germans to China and still today you can see that a lot of people think you can do China in one trip. <laughs> Whereas China is as big and as diverse as Europe or as the United States. So it's, it's absolutely nonsense to say I go to Beijing, Shanghai, uh, uh, Tian, uh, Guilin, Hong Kong, uh, 5,000 kilometers in one trip. But still many people do that because they think, okay, this is, this is one place. And, and of course, if you if, if you have a, a map of the world uh, in China, where China is in the middle, and Europe is somewhere on the upper left corner, it looks very uh, small. And uh, so I, I can remember when I was still a tour operator in the 1990s, bringing Chinese people to Europe, and there was much less information in in China uh, than it is today. People would ask me, is is there a, a metro from uh, from Paris to Rome? because they thought the distance on the map looked so small. Uh, so nowadays, of course, everybody knows the answer to that, but uh, this is not the case. But this was, uh, so therefore, from as we think all the Chinese are the same, the many Chinese people have uh, had, let's say, the same idea. Now, generally, you can, you can say that the Chinese know much more about us than we know about the Chinese. So. Uh, a normally educated Chinese person knows Bach and Shakespeare, uh, how many Chinese composers and Chinese uh, playwrights do you know? Zero. So uh, the Chinese watch Hollywood movies, how many Chinese movies have you seen? Probably uh, only a few. And those were export movies for the Western market. Uh, good, so good therefore, part, but... it, 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 is, it is clearly that, that uh, so more and more people are saying, okay, I want to travel because I have this is a special interest or I, I heard about this in this place and, and, and uh, they are. Also, at the beginning, people thought, well, maybe I can have only one or two trips. So I have to put everything into one trip. Maybe I never come back. Now, as this has become a normal part of the lifestyle, you're also more relaxed because, because it's okay. This year, when I'm, I go to Europe and I, I concentrate on, I don't know, Spain and Portugal. And so I don't see Denmark and, and, and uh, Sweden. Never mind, I come back in two years and then I will go to the north. Uh, so people are much more relaxed about that. Wolfgang, you and me always seem to run over time <laughs> because it's so interesting. But before, before we stop, Wolfgang, um, let us briefly talk about our expo, which we together, BOSS and Cotri are planning. Um, we have started slowly to plan an expo in five or six weeks time. Uh, we are talking about two days. We are talking about putting together a couple of um, expert panels, a couple of presentations, and we are talking about um, presenting Chinese outbound to the rest of the world and the other way around. Um, very interesting because as you said, Chinese outbound probably will be one of the first big 
markets to open, right? Yes. Any comments? Yes, so first of all, I'm happy that we can do this together. And so this is a, uh, also the launch of, of a book, uh, uh, which uh, we, are, we are publishing, which is, uh, I'm still doing the finishing touches to that, which also includes not only stuff I've been writing, but also we have 10 interviews from experts from different fields, uh, giving their, their point of view of uh, how, the, how the future will look like for the Chinese Open Tourism. Uh, and uh, and of course, yes, you're you're uh, you're absolutely right that uh, the the market where the the, the traveling will start first uh, is very likely to be the Chinese market, and uh, so in in also in, in in bigger numbers, as we just discussed, you have to well, you have to invest in in this trust and satisfaction so that you people uh, dare to come, dare to travel again, and also that they think it's worthwhile doing it because there is a good uh, time awaiting them. So if you manage that, then I'm, I'm sure that will be easier. Uh, then then uh, maybe the numbers will not grow anymore like they did all the time before, so maybe they will uh, for this year, certainly they will go down, but maybe for next year, uh, they will not reach 2019 level or just reach 2019 level. But uh, from 2022, if uh, no, uh, what you call the gray rhino, so not a black swan, a new gray rhino is appearing, uh, then uh, that, 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 that should be there. And so, yes, yeah, so we will, we will have from this uh, interview partners who also are in the book, so they will be together with some other people, the panelists, and they come from, uh, on the one hand, United uh, Nations World Children Organization. So from uh, from a official side, from uh, from an overview side, uh, up to uh, two operators from Albania and uh, airports uh, managers. So very very diverse uh, group of people. All of them have been working. Uh, for the Chinese market for years, and have uh, uh, I, I, I read the answers they gave in the interview, and this is really worthwhile uh, listening uh, to them. And uh, well, we will see. Maybe also in a month from now, we have an answer. What about the yeah. quarantine, and what about the opening of the borders from from the European side, and so on? Uh, so that uh, this will also be a uh, extension of what we're doing uh, this week. And certainly uh, people should put this into a, a, a calendar. So uh, we will, we have yeah, to make the final date, but I think it's, a, I put on my slides August 4, but <laughs> let's see. Yeah. Uh, maybe that is the date, maybe we have to move it a, a bit, but in uh, within this period of time, I think we will do that. And of course, uh, in the long run, well, the Chinese market is by far the biggest in, in terms of, of, of travels in the past. And, and very, it's a very simple calculation. We have about, in China now, about 150 million people who can afford to travel, let's say, to Europe. In the European Union, we have about 450 million people now, about uh, UK. But not everybody in Europe can afford to travel to China. So if we are optimistic, we can say maybe one third of the Europeans have enough money to travel to China, which is also 150 million. So we can say that that the Chinese mar outbound market long distance is as big as the European outbound market long distance. And of course, well, for America has 320 or 330 million. Yeah, yeah, so and uh, but only 40% of uh, Americans have a passport, so therefore the American market is much smaller. This is this is uh, just 100, and not everybody with a passport is rich enough to travel long distance. So this market is maybe like one 100 billion, so uh, smaller than European or the Chinese market. So just to give this this dimension, uh, because it's not about the question, whereas for instance India has now almost 1.4 billion, like China, 
they are their own, they will overtake China as the most populous country in a few years, but they have much less rich people. So the, the upper class is much smaller. So mm. therefore, uh, it's not a question how many inhabitants you have in that country, it's how many people are, are traveling and internationally. And uh, as you can see, Germany has only 80 million, but we are still number three in uh, global uh, traveling. So we are not longer the, uh, the world champions. So that's but number, number one, if we compare to the number of people, right? Yeah, but if you do this per person, Certainly, yeah. certainly. Yeah. So per person, the Germans German is spend far. 10 times, 12 times, <laughs> 50 yeah. times as much as the Chinese. But uh, for heaven's sake, don't let 1.4 billion Chinese travel internationally. Uh, where to put them? No way. Wolfgang, we are 12 minutes past time. Let me, Alexandra is actually helping me because she is writing a message here, which is the perfect way to stop this great session. Professor Wolfgang, we have learned a lot from you, not only about China tourism, but in general. Thank you very much. I couldn't have said it any better. Thank you a lot, Wolfgang, Thank and you, you too. For everybody, have a good rest of the, of the fair. Use the one-to-one uh, -one meeting system. Uh, that is very useful. And uh, Jan, thank you very much all the people behind the scenes for the te technology uh, keeping things running thanks to you as well and uh, yeah so hopefully in a month or so we meet again here sure thank you welcome thank you